Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current status of my Sunday sermon. In 1984, Apple Computer Company put an ad on TV that won a lot of awards. Apple saw itself as a scrappy upstart that was going to challenge big bad IBM. On January 24, Apple would reintroduce the Macintosh and it would revolutionize, it would revolutionize computing so that 1984 wouldn't be 1984. Apple was going to um, cut the legs out from Big Brother from George Orwell's classic novel. Well, Apple is no longer a scrappy upstart. Apple competes to have the largest market cap of any American company. They're right up there at the top in 2019. If you look at market caps in 2019 compared to 2000, some of you might be surprised. In 2000, a bunch of names you might, you'd might you recognize. General Electric, Cisco, Exxon Mobil, Pfizer, Microsoft, Walmart, Citigroup, Vodafone, Intel, Royal Dutch Shell. If you look at at least the fourth quarter of 2019 before COVID, you've got Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, that's Google, Facebook, Alibaba, um, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Tension, JP Morgan Chase, and Visa. Apple no longer a scrappy upstart. So when Epic Games decided to sue Apple over the 30% chunk they wanted from Fortnite monies, Epic Games made their own little commercial, which basically had Apple as Big Brother, and here comes the, the, the Fortnite character, and she's going to smash the big bad Apple, just like the Apple commercial. The children of Israel want liberation. We started with that last week. The, rever the revolutionary script is very old indeed. Ask the original Sargon of Akkad who killed his way up to the top of the totem pole and became the first great emperor, at least in that part of the world, at least in recorded history. Kill your way to power is the way it's usually done. Once you're in power, you'll do the right thing, right? Well, Google's model is don't be evil. Adopted that model when it was a much smaller company. Some people wonder. Amazon is a scrappy little bookseller. Well. Amazon's pretty big now, too, upending almost all the retail, especially in this COVID time. Exodus is a study of liberation. There's no question about Egypt's guilt in this, but revolution means going round and round and round. The question is, does God see? Does God know? Can God save? Will God save? Is, there, is this God of Israel ready to act? How does God save? What will bring justice? What does taking justice into our hands do to us? Now, last week we met our would-be revolutionary, a failure, and now he's pursuing a career working for his father-in-law, tending sheep. Tending sheep is about the one of the lowest professions you can find. No real, no real skill involved. Just well, some guts for you know warding off wild animals ask you know david but moses out there tending the flock of jethro his father-in-law the priest of midian and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to horeb the mountain of god hmm now wilderness is important here and the symbolisms are important here moses is out of watery egypt this place of life this place of land and god shows up in the wilderness. The same God who carved creation out of the Tohu Wavohu watery depths, this God shows up on the mountain. And the angel of the Lord, now you'll find the Hebrew Bible kind of interchangeably, interchangeably shows manifestations of God with the angel of the Lord, appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn. I'm sure he saw lots of grass fires, the kinds that we see in California often. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. Many times in the Bible, God describes himself as a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4.24, the Lord, with his name, 
your God is a consuming fire. There's fire on Sinai. There's fire in the altar. Aaron's sons are killed because they try to introduce strange fire instead of the fire of God. Uh, the fire of God rains down on Carmel for Elijah. Tongues of fire show up in Acts 2. Now, the strange thing is that the bush is not consumed. And, and this is an image of God living in the midst of his people. The consuming fire and a people not consumed. God's people are, in a sense, that bush. And this is an image of Moses' calling, what Moses will be called to do. Now, sacrificial animals usually carry the guilt of the people's sins into the fire and are consumed. The question is, will God consume Israel? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. There are certainly ideas floating out there about God and holiness and fire. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now I colored this page in the way I did so that you could see some of the structure of it because you might have noticed the repetition and if you look at it there's a ver there's an A B C C B A which is not an unusual pattern that that you'll find in the Bible to sort of bring emphasis to certain layers and quite obviously the emphasis here is on the rescue. And what's interesting is that first God initiates the rescue and verse 10 so now go. God is going to rescue them. So Moses, now you go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now we might imagine Moses is excited about this. He had a failed career as a revolutionary. But that's not the way it goes. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? I tried once. It failed. And bring the Israelite out of Egypt. I'm a failure. I'm a lousy shepherd out here in the wilderness working for my father-in-law. And God said, I will be with you. But Moses only begun to object and try to avoid. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your father has sent me to you. And they say, what is his name? What shall I tell them? Because they've obviously forgotten him. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, that's what he just said before, if you remember, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Now, we could, ex we could easily spend all of our time just on the name. This is the revelation of the name, and there's a never-ending debate about its meaning. It isn't that we don't know anything about it, but we can't seem to exhaust it. We can't seem to get our hands around it. Philosophically, he's the ground of all being. He's the source of all being. Existentially, I will be who I will be, ever disclosing himself through history. The name of God. Once you have a name of something, you have a different relationship with whatever that is. You shall not take my name in vain, one of the commandments will say. And there's something of the nature of Egyptians' gods were always disclosed by their name. So it's no wonder the Israelites would ask, but the name is surprising indeed. Usually names were connected to some force in nature, some thing in nature, some thing in creation, but this isn't. 
this seems to be above, beneath, below, all around, but you can't quite get your arms around it. There's nothing like him in creation. He is everywhere in creation. Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you, and I have seen what you have done, and I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. I have promised to bring you out of your misery into Egypt, into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. Notice the repetition from verses 7 through 10. The elders of Israel will listen to you, God tells Moses. Moses isn't convinced. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take the three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Now, there's a little bit of trickery here because no word of just keeping going, but Pharaoh isn't going to let them go even for this. But the call is that these people are owned by a god. Now, an Egyptian pharaoh would understand all this business about gods and ownership. He's a god-man himself. But is this god like their gods? But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptian with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, they will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people, so that when you leave, you will, go, you will not go out empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and your daughters. You're there as slaves. You'll leave as royalty. And so you will plunder the Egyptian. Now again, if we look at Sargon of Akkad, everybody understood what it meant to overthrow and to plunder. But notice here again, who is doing the heavy lifting? Moses isn't done. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me or say, the Lord did not appear to you? And so then the Lord gives Moses three signs, and they're very interesting signs. The staff becomes a serpent and then back to a staff again. His hand becomes leprous and then back to normal again. And Nile water is turned to blood. What's interesting about all these three signs is that they're unclean. Serpents are unclean animals, the chaos animal of the garden. The uh, leprosy was an unclean illness that would drive you from the camp. And blood is unclean. You're not to eat meat with blood in it. And if, if in fact, you, you do bleed, you have to go outside the camp. Blood is meant to stay inside the body. So there's uncleanliness, disorder, and chaos. And for the first two, chaos is, chaos is precipitated by the sign and then resolved, but not for the Nile. God, through Moses, brings order to chaos to order, Except the last sign, what remains of the Nile water is blood. The Nile is, of course, considered a god, sacred, the giver of life. And Moses will turn it to blood. All of the symbolism is pointing towards something really big. The people should get this when Moses shows it to them. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. The people of God keep pushing God's patience with their unbelief. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Interesting that this is the same promise given to Jesus' apostles. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Moses finally gets to the point. He does not want to do it. He does not want to follow. He basically says no to God and God won't take no for an answer. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. This won't be the last time we see his anger burning. He's a, re he's a consuming fire. And so right now, in a sense, Moses talking to the angel of the Lord in the bush, 
is already enacting what we will see later in the story. And he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. Isn't it interesting the way God sets up this relationship with the two of them? But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let his people go. Then, said, um, then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go, so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Notice, if you remember from last week, Pharaoh plotted the death of Israel's son. God owns Israel as a firstborn son and claims Israel as such. And now God will threaten Pharaoh's son in return. God is going to do something and Pharaoh is going to be judged because of what he did. Now at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cutting off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to, bride, bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Now, this is a very strange little episode, and again, we could spend a lot of time on it because there's no end of speculation and wondering about that. It seems to have everything to do with the wilderness, which is sort of the chaotic counterpart of the chaotic sea. It's not habitable land, unlike Egypt and then Canaan. And in the story of the desert wanderings, you'll notice that the people of Israel who are born in the desert are not circumcised until they go back into the land. There's no circumcision in the wilderness. They're living on the margins, which is sort of why God feeds them in the desert himself, because it's not a place that God is feeding them through the normal means. Now they're entering into the land. There are new rules, and Zipporah saves Moses. Is this a sign of Moses' ongoing reluctance? In this story of fathers and sons, Moses is impotent. But, though, um, but through Zipporah and circumcision, the son is saved. Now, we're going to see the shedding of blood for the salvation of God's firstborn as well. Now, you'll notice a little bit of interesting timing because God already said, Aaron is on his way to meet you. And I even skipped a few verses in here just to make it a little more brief. And so then the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him um, to say, and also about all the signs he was commanded to perform. So Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of Israel. And Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed signs before the people and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord has, was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. But remember, they're going to have to worship him on the margins in the wilderness. They're worshipping in Egypt, but this is just the beginning. Now, Moses is a failed would-be revolutionary. Mo God calls Moses from his menial existence after his failure, Moses is reluctant, feels inadequate, doesn't want the job, tries just about everything to get out of the job. God will not be deterred. God has been moving on this through the circumstances of Moses' birth. God has been setting this up before Moses was born. He will be, Moses will be God's tool, but not as Moses imagines. Now, a careful reader might have noted that, and I do this sometimes, I skipped a verse because I wanted us 
to slow down and see it more clearly. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And the answer to that is, um, yeah, you're right. You have a point with this one. You are not able to do this. I will be with you. And notice how Moses, Moses, Aaron in a sense goes before and Moses is sort of like God behind the scene. And this is how this whole thing is set up. But then this is the part I skipped when I read it before. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Now, Moses is nervous, unwilling. Is he really looking for confirmation or is he just looking for excuses? But the sign that he's given, anyone would pause and say, now, wait a minute. The sign that I'm giving for the assurance of success, I only receive after success has been achieved. Notice the play of mountains in the Bible. The book of Ezekiel frames Eden as a mountain with four streams. The burning bush here this episode is on a mountain, the mountain of the Lord, Horeb, as it's called. Aaron meets on the mountain Moses with a kiss. And already the dynamic of Moses and Aaron is being set up. Sinai, where they come back to and where they do the worshiping, again, will be, will be the mountain. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives the new law from the mountain. Jerusalem is Mount Zion, the center of the world, as it were, because of the temple. And then Golgotha, just outside of Jerusalem, where Jesus is killed. Now, this is a strange sign for nervous Moses. Anyone would say, wait a minute. So the sign of your presence will be after the deliverance is achieved. This is supposed to comfort me now. And in fact, if we think a little bit longer about the role that Moses will play, perhaps his first 40 years as in Egypt, and then his would-be assassination, flees to the desert, spends another 40 years in the desert, and Moses, the liberator, will live the rest of his life after the Red Sea or Reed Sea crossing and go back out to the desert. Moses is a liminal figure. Moses is, in that way, a creature of the margin. Moses is God's own tool to reveal himself to the people and to carry them through the desert. Moses points to Jesus. Now, there's a series of failed revolutions, and you probably have them in your life. There are failed acts of liberation, and you probably have those in your life. God, it seems, picks his own time. And I know you probably have complaints, problems, issues with the timing of God. I think probably every servant of God does. But he gives his promises. I will be with you. I will share my name with you. I will reveal myself to you. I will show you wonders. But just like the sign Moses is given, you will often only know in hindsight. You will be able to testify in the past for when God showed up and liberated you from something that you believed had trapped you. But every time a new challenge comes forward, there you are again. And still you must obey. You must move ahead. He is with you. He is behind you and before you. And when he calls you, he won't let you go. Sure, you want someone else to make the sacrifice. What you must do is obey and learn to trust.